In this episode of the podcast, I sit down with my friend, Mr. Steve Brazel of the Behind the Shot podcast. Steve is a photographer. He's a radio personality. He is a whiskey aficionado. He is a martial artist. He's a renaissance man. We're going to dive into the background and the foreground of Steve Brazel in this episode of This Week in Photo. This is Twit. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Today, you know what, I always say this. I always say I have something special for you. This is a very special interview or this is a special guest or whatever. I really mean it this time. I really mean it. <laughs> Not that I didn't mean it all the other hundreds of times, but today I get to sit down with a friend and it's always great to sit down with somebody who has very similar interests to you, is doing things that are similar to you that you can learn from and just sort of shoot the breeze with about all things technology, all things photography, etc. My good friend, Mr. Steve Brazel, as you heard in that intro, is joining me today to just catch up. We're going to dive into the world of Steve, into his, his very popular podcast, Behind the Shot. We're going to talk about him and his background in radio. We're going to talk about him as a concert photographer, all of that stuff. We're going to try to get it all into this interview. Before we start that, though, Steve Brazel, welcome to the show, man. How are you doing? Oh, oh, oh my god. Oh, are we on? Oh, okay. <laughs> you need more. You I'm missed good, the spot. Man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Thanks thanks for coming on. Thanks for coming on. You know, before you before you give us before we dive into this interview in earnest, um I got to give you kudos because you have over the years have given me lots of tips from your extensive background in, uh, I guess, is is the is the term terrestrial radio? Is that yeah, terrestrial radio? Yeah, traditional media. Traditional media. I mean, as you as folks, as you listen to this, you can tell that Steve has that, you know, that 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 morning zoo thing going on in, <laughs> in his voice. So um, so let's dive in, Steve. Like the for the folks that may not have heard of Behind the Shot, may not have heard of Steve Brazel. What's your elevator pitch? You're stuck in an elevator with, I don't know, some some famous photographer and they're like, what do you do, sir? What do, what do you say? Usually when somebody says to me, what do you do for a living? Uh, my response is it depends what day you hit me. Because traditionally, like I've been in radio for something like 43 years or something like that. And the radio station I'm at now, which is 96.7 KCAL Rocks in, in Redlands, California, I've been there since 1987. Uh, I've been on the air there. So I've been in radio for a long, long time. And then at a certain point, I started teaching computers, became an independent IT consultant. That's kind of what I did, quote unquote, for a living. And then I got into photography. And once I got into photography, and I still did all of, all of the other things, still do all of the other things. But once I got into photography, uh, just kind of my mindset on life changed. I'm a music photographer, a concert photographer. And uh, I wanted to find a way to kind of blend all of those years doing what I love in radio. I love being behind a microphone and I've done some on camera stuff with local television in the city that I live in hosting different shows, but I kind of wanted to mix that with the modern world. And so a photography podcast became my, my kind of idea and dream. And then you and I are in LA with you about to get out of the car in a suit and tie to run down the street to save our reservation at the Magic Castle. Yes. Which, do you remember that? I remember that. I remember that. It's like, I remember the States. It's like 98. <laughs> yeah, it's like 98 degrees outside. We're stuck in traffic. Our Magic Castle reservation's in five minutes and we're 15 minutes away. And Frederick goes, I'll just, I'll run down there. And he gets out of the car and he runs down the street in Hollywood, California to get to the Magic Castle to hold our reservation. Well, that night, you said you should do your podcast on my network. Yeah. And that's how Behind the Shot started, was I started on the TWIP network, and uh, <clears throat> it is still going to this day, six years or whatever later. I love that. I love that. It's a great show, too. And and the the whole idea behind the show, well, I'll let you break it down. So it's kind of in the title, but what what is the different take 
on photography podcasts that, that you do on Behind the Shot? It, it's funny because the, heli- the helicopter pitch for Behind the Shot originally came from you and I bantering back and forth. And the way I describe it to people is you're getting inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots from conception to completion and all the stories and challenges that happen in between. In other words, the other way that I describe it is it's me and a guest interviewing one of their photographs. What Mm -hmm. does that photograph say? How was it made? What was the scenario? What was the environment? Basically, the goal is to try and understand why that photographer, why that creative made the the creative choices that they did. Why did you use F11 and or why did you, you know, shoot at F.8? You know, why did you use that lens? Where did you set up the remote camera to get this? And it's it's genre agnostic, which hurts me in some ways, podcast wise. Yeah. As you very well know, people people have a tendency to only want to watch a show if it matches their genre. So if I have a tour photographer like David Bergman for Luke Combs, tour photographer for the country star Luke Combs, if I have him on, the people who watch my show that are landscape photographers go, yeah, I, I'm not I'm never going to shoot music. I don't need to see that. <clears throat> and I think you and I have had this discussion before, and I'm curious what you think. I learn more from genres that are not music than I do from other music photographers. Other music photographers teach me some things. The first time I was in a photo pit with Alan Hess, who was a hero of mine, and I met him that day. And as I was shooting, I kind of spent the afternoon watching what he did. And he seemingly slowed everything down and he went anywhere other people were not. And I learned from that. But I learn way more from genres that I don't shoot. I learned to apply layering in music photography from Mm. understanding a a genre I'm horrible at. I am a horrible landscape photographer, but I learned layering in photography, foreground, mid-ground, background subjects from landscape photographers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Don't you agree? I do agree. And that works for most things, right? Exercising... A muscle that you don't exercise generally all the time is a good thing, right? Especially creatively to get you out of your, your, get you off of the railroad tracks of what you're used to and going through the motions and getting the result to grow. You gotta, or to get bigger, right? You gotta, you gotta exercise muscles that you haven't, you haven't touched before. You know, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you as a, as a fellow podcaster is, uh, especially in this genre of podcasting, photography and interviewing photographers, have you seen, or I know you have seen, so let me rephrase the question, what patterns in the chaos have poked out for you over the last several years in terms of, wow, I'm seeing a lot of this, or I'm seeing less of that, or people seem to be gravitating towards this or more or less gear talk like best back in the day. What are, what are you seeing, if anything? Actually, that last part kind of struck me because of the new Lumix S9 announcement. Mm. You know, more or less gear talk. Yeah. Photo YouTube is all over gear, right? I mean, in, in kind of a crazy way. But I think viewers are much more skeptical of what they see on YouTube And I think unfairly, I think the default is to assume that anybody who's commenting on a product on YouTube is a shill, that somehow they're getting paid for it or the big conversation that a couple of people had in in relation to the the new Lumix Lumix S9 review where they flew a bunch of people to Osaka, Japan is, well, they flew them there. So obviously, you know, you're a shill, you're only going to say what that company wants, which is completely crap. You can't buy every piece of gear like you cannot own every piece of gear. And if a company is going to fly you somewhere and let you use gear and tell you about their gear, a they're only going to tell you the positives. It's on you to find the negatives, but it doesn't mean you're beholding to them. I mean, that that's that's insane. You still have character and reputation to maintain. Right. But the other thing I think I've noticed, like you asked what trends I see and I'll speak to music photography. And boy, am I going to get emails on this one. Oh, I should just (laughs) shut up now. There is this trend now in using prism type filters. 
So like the old token. Yeah, like a screw on filter, but it's a prism. So it creates, um, you know, multiple images or Mm -hmm. every single spotlight on the stage becomes this radical starburst um, or you know, you get these circles around somebody like you took Vaseline and s- smeared it on the screen, except for where the person's face is. Yeah. And I think it's the the old school in me. And I understand, look, I'm a big proponent of you have your own photographic voice. That's what people people come have come to you, too. You know, how do you find your style? What, what is mm-hmm. your style? Well, your style is the way you shoot that nobody else can. Because even though you're going to choose uh, a particular concert and I'm going to be standing in a photo pit next to three other photographers with the exact same gear as me, with the exact same time limitations as me, we're not going to shoot the same shot because everybody has their own photographic voice, right? Yeah. It, it You have a voice in your head that says do X. I don't shoot a lot of vertical vertical pictures. For some we- weird reason, my mind does not see vertical composition in camera. Hmm. I shoot everything almost horizontal. There's exceptions, but most of the time. And then if I really decide in post, I want it vertical, I'll crop it vertical. But that's the way my mind works. And I think that, you know, nowadays there is this, which it's always existed, but I think it's worse now to some extent with these filters and stuff like that. I think there's much more trend in photography the wedding photos that are you know warm yellow light with super bright backlight okay i love that look Mm -hmm. until every photographer is doing it and doing it because others are doing it um yeah well that's a trend i I don't know it's hard to explain yeah i mean that yeah just uh i want to i want to address that kind of you know the screw on prism look yeah. that, that some photographers are using. Um, we've talked about this on This Week in Photo before, just the, the idea of does it make sense to, to alter the light rays that are coming in your camera and permanently burn those into the raw file when you could do it in post? I think it was in the context of Lens Baby, right? Which I love. I know Craig Strong over yep. there. Lens Baby's great. Um, Lens Baby... When I look at a lens baby lens, I have a couple of them. When I when I put those on my camera, I feel like I'm moving into a fun mode, a more of a, a serendipity mode of, yeah, I'm going to get some cool stuff. I don't know exactly what I'm going to get, but it's going to be cool. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to play with it. But when you, and of course, all rules are fuzzy, right, in photography. But when you you move into a professional type modality where you need to be more precise, I think that is dangerous, right? Because you're shooting something and you're doing all this stuff to the image that you can't reverse, right? It's a one-way trip. You're baking that into the raw file. Then like later, if you had shot it regular with raw, just straight on, straight out, straight off the sensor, you can say, oh yeah, I want to put a starburst in there. I want to do this. I want to blur the background a little bit. I do all the things in post these days. Um, But, you know, if you've done that in camera, then you're kind of, you know, you're kind of locked in. So I just want to throw that in there. So there's like a world for both, right? Nick Nick Analog Effects lets you do most of that. It's not the exact same look, but it lets you do most of that. And let me be clear, they're tools, right? Uh, uh, Whatever you want to do, you want to put a prism lens or it's no different than putting a a circular, circular polarizer on your lens. They're tools to be used. But the analogy I use to people is when you watch American Idol or The Voice or you know, a singing competition, how many times have you heard the judges or whoever it is, the coach, say, man, you can really do those runs, but you did a run every two seconds. Mm-hmm. Just don't do it every two seconds. Save it up and make it something special, right? It's a tool. Please go buy your filters, use your filters. But when I see somebody shoot a very rare show, in my case, again, I'm going to music photography, but this applies to everything. Yeah. Um, Green Day just played the House of Blues. Mm. Green Day. They play stadiums. They're at a House of Blues. And there were a couple people who shot the show almost entirely affected, 
right? With, with some effect on every shot. Mm. And I thought, you know, this is an iconic moment. This is a Hall of Fame band in a tiny 1800 seat venue or whatever it is. You have an opportunity here to journalistically document this. And I understand I can't speak for you. If that's not what you want, I get it. However, I think you miss the opportunity to see, it would be my argument, uh, that you had an opportunity here to document an iconic performance. And then artistically, if you want to do something to some shots, great. But doing them to all the shots, I think is a missed opportunity. Yeah, Can't speak for other people. I would just put that in your head that was that a missed opportunity to use, to overuse a tool. And it's dangerous too, and in, in some ways, because if you're again, you're shooting Green Day, it's iconic, right? And you're you're something. Let's say, knock on wood, something happens to Green Day after you've shot them. Now those photos are like historic, right? But there's one perfect shot in there that you love, but you used a filter on it uh, on the lens, and there's a lens flare shooting through the 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 lead singer's face, you know, obscuring it. Sure, you could probably fix it, maybe, but you know. Wouldn't it be better just And the to band may love it. <laughs> yeah. But the but if something tragic were to happen, the newspaper's probably going to pick somebody else's shot that's more journalistic. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I yeah, this, this stuff is that's the, that's the cool thing about photography though, right? I mean, it's in a constant state of evolution. I remember when Lens Baby first popped on the scene, it was like, holy crap, look at that. That's almost like a tilt ship lens and it's a little yep. thing and I can do all this cool stuff with. And it's still that way. But I think our, our perceptions as artists and the consumers of the art and content that we create, the bar is moving, you know, because of AI and because of how capable these cameras are now. And, and back in the day, it used to be a magic trick just to get a blurry background in your photo, right? right. You, got, you got to have an expensive camera to get a blurry background now. I mean, you can do it on your iPhone, right? So things change. These change over time. Think about this, though, because what yeah. you said about it, Lens Baby, is true. I remember when they first came out and we were all like, what a cool little thing that you move this thing around. <laughs> but... I'm not going to say they've fallen out of favor, but you don't hear about them every day. It's kind of like we wore, I mean, okay, they're back now, but you know, we wore bell bottoms in the seventies <laughs> and you know, we wore puka shells in the seventies and some of the design choices that we wore as youth, uh, we look at now in photos and go, what the hell was I thinking? Yeah. Not because it's bad, but because the trend isn't popular anymore. That is the danger of a trend. I mean, right now, yes, you can wear bell bottoms again and you can buy puka shells and blah, blah, blah. But that's the danger of, of going with a trend is that shot is baked into a time in essence. Yep. It's no longer timeless. Yeah. And I love you, I know you and I have had this conversation before. There is nothing like seeing a timeless photo. When people talk to me about, you know, I, you know, to shoot this concert, I've got to go to 6,400 ISO and I don't, I don't want to go that high on my ISO. And I always tell them, ignore the noise. The most iconic photographs of our lives, at least of my life, are full of noise, yeah. right? Nobody ever walks up and goes, that shot of Kent State from 1968, man, did that have a lot of noise? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That shot of Muhammad yeah. Ali, you know that that shot of of the Rolling Stones or the Beatles in in a basement in Germany in 1964. Oh my gosh, look at the noise in that shot. Nobody says that because no. the shot's iconic. Yeah, yeah. So and, that's and the danger of a trend. And yeah, and trends, trends or things in a photo that immediately identify the era that that photo was taken yes. in. For example, um, any photo taken during COVID with people with masks on, you're automatically going to know, oh, there's a mask. Oh, I kind of know when that was taken and why, you know. Yep. So and it, it, not that that's necessarily a negative thing, but it, it instantly puts the viewer in a state of mind of, oh, yeah, I remember COVID. Yeah, I remember the whole mask thing and all that. Right. So these things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you if you see a movie and somebody ha is taking a photo with a flip phone camera with a screen that's this big, <laughs> <clears throat> you know, it's post introduction of cell phones. Yeah. 
but it's pre iPhone. Yep. Right. Yep. There are choices that you can make to be dated, which is great. And there's choices you can make to be timeless. I'm just saying it's a thought you should have. So, so uh, good segue, because the next thing I want to talk about is uh, concert photography, uh, a genre that you know a little bit about, right? So the, when, you, when you're talking about photography in the context of keeping it timeless, how do you keep a band timeless? Like, how do you keep that kind of photography iconic? I think I kind of know the answer to this. I would love to hear if you, if you articulate what I'm thinking. That's a really good question. I, I think, so the problem with concert photography being timeless, obviously, is people age, right? Yeah. <laughs> there, there are some bands that will have a contract you have to sign, a photo release you have to sign when you shoot a show, and they vary in, in aggressiveness from, you know, you can shoot our whole set. This was Cage the Elephant, actually. This blew my mind. Uh, when they put it in front of me, I'm like, oh, I don't even know that I want to shoot the band, but okay, what's it say? Basically, all it said was, we're going to let you shoot our entire set as long as if you get hurt, you don't sue us. There's other ones that are standard editorial releases, which is you can shoot this show. You can use it for editorial press coverage review type thing of the show. No commercial use, which kind of goes without saying anyway, because for that, you'd need a model release. There's some that take your copyright. But there are some specifically that say, it's not as often that I see this, but it does happen. You're allowed to use these for editorial coverage for one year past the period that they were shot. Hmm. And I've always in my head assigned that to the fact of, I've never asked anybody, but that singer is going to change. And when that singer is heavier or bald or older or whatever it might be, um, or thinner or whatever the change, physical change is, they don't want that era of their band to resurface in editorial coverage. And that's the problem with making something timeless in music photography is Mick Jagger isn't what he is now from what he was then. Yeah. Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters doesn't look now like he did when he was with Nirvana. So if you're talking about Dave Grohl and you post a Nirvana shot, it's kind of out of context there. Yeah, yeah. My argument would be the way that you keep them timeless is you look at them the way I think they're intended, which is documentary, journalistically. Again, part of the reason I love music photography is it's one of the rare genres where an individual shot can be utilized in multiple ways and is often. Any, any genre can, but in music photography, if I shoot a show <clears throat> for KCAL, for my radio station, that in essence is journalistic, or if I'm shooting for a magazine or newspaper, whatever, <clears throat> and I have journalistic integrity issues that I should or could follow, right? Generally, mm -hmm. it's you can crop it, you can color correct it, you can dodge and burn. You can't clone out a microphone stand in journalism, traditionally. On the other hand, if I'm shooting that exact same show for the venue, that's not journalism. That's a marketing, commercial marketing shoot. And they may want to print a poster and hang it on the venue wall that says, join the VIP club. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to compose it differently. I'm going to edit it differently. And then, and this has happened to me where I've shot for a venue or for press. And then the artist comes to me and says, can I use that? shot okay now i can re-edit it and do stuff because again now it's a marketing shot for the artist yeah and and the way that you keep that universality the way that you keep that good over time to me is to stay true to the scene document what you saw as accurate as you can possibly be yeah and it, and it depends a lot of it depends on, I mean, obviously the end use of it, which is what you were describing, right? right? So, so you know, if, you, if you're shooting something and the, the ultimate end use is to convince somebody to do something um, commercially, i.e. I want you to buy this or come there or, you know, do some sort of action, that's a marketing thing. 
um, arguably by on the this photo- wedding dress because of this bride. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Arguably on the on the photojournalistic side, you you are still trying to uh, convince someone to do something or to understand a topic like, you know, if, if I went to San Francisco and I wanted to do a photojournalistic piece on homelessness in San Francisco or the drug epidemic or something like that, the goal is to raise awareness of that particular topic, hopefully a percentage of the audience will then act and do something or the viewing audience will act and do something, which means I can't edit those images because uh, because I'm misrepresenting the truth. Those images must be truthful in their conveyance of the situation. From a marketing standpoint, if, you're, if your goal is to sell tourism to San Francisco, <laughs> then you know all bets are off. Oversaturated colors, remove the garbage from the street, no needles, you know, <laughs> all, all yeah. of the things. The needles are a big one, up. yeah. The needles are a big one. Clone the needles. The new remove tool in Lightroom is going to come in handy for those. But you know, you brought up a good point. You brought up a good point and that is, if you're photographing using your homeless example, right? If you're photographing that to document the the plight of the unhoused yeah that what you're talking about is storytelling which is what photography is let's be honest you're always if it's done properly you're you're not just capturing a pretty moment you're kind of telling a story and we make choices that colorize that story no matter what we do it may not be because we have a bias it may be because we just think it makes the story more Uh, absorbable or understandable or powerful. We may choose to shoot with a 70 to 200 as opposed to a 15 millimeter. We may choose, I think there's a famous, uh, I'm trying to remember what war it was, where there was a particular scene that we know that the camera was pointed in such a way to make it look horrible, but that there were normal people on the left and right simply Mm -hmm. by where you stood to take the picture and how you pointed the lens. Yeah. We make those those choices as we do photography. Again, all of that's okay. My only advice to most people is don't go into it. Another one I'll get into is Dutch angle. (laughs) My advice to people is don't go into it and just go, hmm, what do we got? Oh, click. Oh, click. Oh, click. Think about it, right? Think about what story I'm telling. Shoot it wide. Shoot it tight. Shoot it medium. Shoot it from different angles or at least think about them before you pull the trigger, right? Think about what your goal is. Are you trying to do tourism for San Francisco or are you trying to talk about the plight of the unhoused? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't think about it, you're telling the wrong story. And one of the things is, I was telling you, I've I've got a thing at six tonight, which is is judging an image competition for professional photographers of LA County, a remote thing. But one of the big problems that, people don't understand is you look at their photo and uh, image competitions and you do your image critiques with Troy, our mutual friend, Troy. Yeah. Um, one of the things people don't understand is if you put a photo in front of me and I go, I don't get it. Right. All I see is you're at a Dutch angle for no purpose. You're not adding tension. Your composition is off. And people come up to me afterwards and they go, okay, so here's the deal. What you don't understand was it was super hot out and all these people were sweaty and I could smell the sweat in the air. And there was a little mist coming down. I wasn't there. I didn't smell it. I didn't hear it. All I have to go off of is your photo. So put some thought into taking that picture. How are you going to convey those things to me? so that I see them without you hanging out over my shoulder and telling me. Yeah. Yeah. And that that goes towards a lot of things. You know, if photographers get in in, into this trap and myself not immune to this is you you feel like, oh, you know, I got a couple hours. I'm going to go out and shoot. I'm just going to go. I'm going to put myself in an interesting location. I'm going to take a drive up to to the to old San old Sacramento and just walk around taking pictures. The, the problem with that is overwhelm because you show up there with a bag with a bunch of lenses in it, which is infinite choice. Right. And then you're overwhelmed with all the things to take photos of. And you come back with a, with an SD card full of nothing because you were shooting nothing. My advice to people when we're doing photo walks or things like that is pick a subject like I'm going to take photos of 
doorknobs or rusty nails or portraits of people wearing red or something like that to give yourself a lattice work like a vine to climb on, you know, and you can you can do stuff outside of that that you find serendipitously, but it, it makes it so much more fun if you get if it's like a if it's like a, a Pokemon hunt for the images, right? <laughs> So you can quote me on that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. And, and what you're talking about is limiting yourself. Yeah. One of the I, I wish I remembered who the source of this was, because I do think that it's a really interesting experiment. And that is limit yourself. And some people will say limit yourself to a certain lens or limit yourself to X or to Y. Um, make it a manual focus lens so that you're really stressed right? <laughs> when yeah. you can't see anything <laughs> without your glasses on. Right. But this one this one person i heard one time and i apologize that i i can't credit who it was came up with a good exercise for photographers that were trying to to you know stretch their their capabilities go to an empty parking lot that's all go to an empty parking lot and try and make 10 really good images mm -hmm. no cars empty parking lot you got lines, you got pavement, you got parking stops. Maybe you have a block wall around the parking lot. Maybe you have a street light. Try and make 10 photos. I don't care what lens or lenses you use. Limit your subject matter to a particular area that to the average eye has no subject. And this is, this is I always think of Troy. Again, Troy Miller, if, the, if you watch TWIP, you know Troy Miller because he does the critique shows with Frederick. Yeah. But Troy's a very good friend of mine. Love the guy like a brother. We're in Vegas for WPPI one time, and we're walking down the strip. And I, I, I don't do street photography. I don't do landscape photography. I suck at all of it. And he kept stopping, and he'd be pointing his camera at the sidewalk or at a wall. And I finally looked at him, and I went, what the hell is it you're doing? Like, I don't even, I don't see what you're seeing. But he has trained his eye to see the shadows, to see the light, to see the shape, to see the, the, the relationships between objects. The man could walk down a street and photograph what I saw as nothing and make beautiful fine art out of it. Yeah, yeah. Stretch yourself, it's an amazing tool. And with, with Troy, that, that comes from 30 years of, of you know, making a living with a camera and, right. uh, you know, shooting weddings and portraits and doing all the things. So he's intrinsically understands how, you know, the, the, the exposure triangle and the composition lighting and all that stuff. He's, uh, he's got it in his head. You know, um, one, one thing I, I have on my notes here to, to run by you while I have you captive is the KCAL stuff, right? So the, mm -hmm. the two sides of Steve Brazel. I'm sure there are multiple sides, but the two sides uh, for this conversation, your your radio, your terrestrial broadcast radio career and the things that you've learned along the way from your 20s when you started to now and photography. What would you say has informed the other? Right. So what from your photographic career has an in, has informed your radio career and what from your radio career has helped inform your photographic career? That's a really good question. Um, and that and there actually is something both ways. So the reason I do music photography, this is the best way that radio has informed my music photography. When my son went to high school, <clears throat> And keep in mind, I grew up, I'm old. I grew up with film cameras. I took pictures all my life with film cameras, family, our, all our family pictures were film. I understood how to use a camera a little bit, but I never got into photography. I don't think I understood it was geeky. Again, I ended up being a network engineer, independent IT consultant. I love geeky. I think I would have gotten into photography, photography a lot younger had I realized how geeky it is. Like, I love that. <clears throat> but when I first got into radio, um, I loved, I did it because I couldn't be Robert Plant and I couldn't be a lead singer, but I could at least play the music. When my son went to high school and he was in marching band, it was, well, I want to take pictures of him. And I went into a Ritz camera and I said to the guy behind the counter, I, my son's going to be a marching band. I'm way up in the stands. It's way down on the football field. Uh, you know, I want to take photographs of this. <clears throat> he sold me an, a, a Canon XTI and he put out two lens, lenses. 
a 70 to 300, 35 to 56, and a 70 to 200, 2.8. And me being the idiot that I was said, well, but the camera body is black and that 70 to 200 is white. Those don't match. And the 70 to 300, well, 300 is more than 200. So I think I want the 70 to 300 because it matches and it goes farther. It was the biggest mistake in photography I ever made. But what it ended up doing was it ended up making me realize what exposure meant because I would zoom in and my exposure would change because it was variable aperture. I had to learn on the fly. I fell in love with low light action photography because of that. And I went to my boss at the radio station. Now, in the early days of radio, <clears throat> meet and greets were for industry people. So we'd get, I've got pictures back here of, of me with artists. <clears throat> Excuse me. We would go into concerts and meet the artists. So when I got into photography for my son, I went to my boss at the radio station and I said, you know, we get backstage and we do the meet and greets. Is there any way we can get photo abilities at a concert? My program director said, I don't know, ask, you know, try. I said, well, they're going to want to know and somehow I got to be able to prove I'm really radio and not faking it, but only the salespeople have business cards. He said, I'll send you the, I'll send you the logo, make a business card. He sent me the logo. I designed a business card that matched KCAL. I've got some graphic design background in me, took it to a pip printing, quick print place. Two days later, I had my business cards applied to shoot a show at the old Universal Amphitheater in Hollywood that was Def Leppard and Heart. And I got approved. And that was my first concert ever was these A-listers. That's very, very unusual. But again, traditional terrestrial radio were seen a little different than, you know, John's music blog. Yep. So radio is really the reason I got into music photography and the reason I was able to get into music photography the other way around is when I now am on the air and I play an artist that I've photographed and I say to the audience, you know, my photos from Shinedown last week at Five Point Amphitheater are up in the KCAL website. I'm playing them and I'm talking, or, or when I say, you know, this song, like I'll research the songs that I'm playing and I'll look them up and find the history of them. And when I, when I say something about a particular song, I can picture in some cases that song live, even if I haven't seen the band. I go to so many concerts that it it informs how I present the music hmm. to an audience verbally, because radio is theater of the mind. We're video today, but radio is theater of the mind. You're driving in your car and you're hearing me talk. How do I convince you that a day to remember is fantastic on stage live? right? Having photographed them informs that. So it kind of, it, it's kind of this symbiotic relationship between shooting shows and better understanding the artists and the music that they perform and then presenting that music to a radio audience. You, Does you, that make sense? That makes a hundred percent sense. And you, you better not ever stop loving music. Right. Because it's you got right. stereo. <laughs> you know, it is an ecosystem that you've built for yourself. You want to one of the other things that I wanted to throw at you is uh, technology. Right. Has as I'm guessing, especially for extreme photographers like yourself that work in extremes, like the spotlight on an artist on stage with fog around. And, you know, you've got all kinds of limitations that you have to overcome and no redos. You know, like, can you sing that song one more time? Because I want, you know, you got to get it right on the shutter click technology. Let, let, and let's take high ISO out of the mix, right? So okay. sure, it was even more challenging when you had a 1600, ISO 1600 roll of film or 32. Now you have, you know, presumably almost unlimited uh, low light sensitivity. What in technology has advanced that has allowed you to do your job better, if anything, beyond high ISO? Easy, subject tracking. So when, uh, when I go shoot a show, I have two camera bodies. I have an R6 on my left hip that I usually keep with a wide angle, either a 15 millimeter fisheye or a 15 to 35, RF 15 to 35, 2.8. On my right hip, 
I alternate between a, a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200. If I'm at the soundboard, which is way back where they're mixing the audio way, way away from the stage, I have a 150 to 600 if I need it. In all of those cases, though, when I first started shooting concerts, I was on a Canon 7D, not a 7D Mark II, an original Canon 7D. And if I went to ISO 3200, it wasn't just that uh, it was grainier in the high ISO issues that you have, et cetera. But when I was in those type of situations where it was super dark, or like you say, a haze or smoke machine filling the stage with haze, mm -hmm. getting focus at times was almost impossible. Autofocus, right? Because autofocus systems use contrast. And if the light is diffused through fog, so much so that it's just a cloud of fog. Think about when you're driving down the road, you lose all detail when you have a lot of low fog. So focus was almost impossible at times, not always, but sometimes. Today, I am able with that R6 and that R5 to focus on a person using a single focus point that has eight assist focus points around it to help it if it loses focus. I have the ability to shoot high speed shutter to try and better get the moment that I want. And the example I always use there is go watch your news channel of choice, CNN, MSNBC, Fox, whatever you watch, grab your remote and think about the fact that you're watching a moving picture in a moving environment. It makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Hit the pause button. Try pausing that picture without the anchor looking weird. It's really hard to freeze a moment in time and have it be flattering, which is what I always want to the subject matter. So the ability for me to shoot at high speed and get those individual in between frames, the ability for me to, and in some cameras pre shoot, the ability for me to track a subject more accurately. And in my case, my favorite thing is I use a dual back button focus. So I, I don't, focus at all with my shutter button that is disabled the shutter button is the trigger nothing else my asterisk button is programmed to switch so when i'm on the af on button i'm a single point with eight helper points around it and i move that around the screen if i hit the asterisk button it switches my camera automatically on the fly to eye and face detection hmm. so when i'm shooting uh Blink-182 or Angels and Airwaves, and Tom DeLong is wearing a hat that's doing this. When he lifts up, I can see his eye and I can get a little bit of his eye to eye focus on it. But otherwise, his eyes are in shadow. I switch over to focus point. So these, these abilities to track and focus more accurately have completely changed music photography. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's so much. There's, I have like... 12 follow-up questions to that, but I'm going <laughs> to, we'll save those for another time. Um, I have, I have two, two pretty big questions to throw at you to see what you think of these. Or Hang on really quick of, though. You said tw yeah. you have, you have 12 follow-up questions. I had 12 follow-up questions, but I'm going to hold them. Okay. I'll just answer them. You don't have to ask them. I'll just answer them. Yes. No, maybe could be. It's always been this way. <laughs> Never. <mind. laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, this is a big question. It may require a pause on your part. You are multidisciplinary, right? With the photography, you do a bunch of other stuff outside of what we've talked about. I know you have lots of interests. Let's just throw one in there, whiskey, right? You have an extensive whiskey collection. You are a whiskey connoisseur. You've sent me whiskey that I've been marinating on and not have, <laughs> I haven't consumed it yet. Um, of all your interests, all your hobbies, all the, the different careers and professions and all the things that you enjoy doing, where where is Steve Brazel going with all this? Like what what is the what is the, the, the holy grail at the end of the day for what Steve is gonna like what what's the end? What's the end game? Wow. 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 You know, that's, that, that is interesting. I don't know what the end game is. I will tell you, and I, I, 
I don't think it's me. I think it's a problem with creatives in general. Yeah. My identity is partly what I do. Right. And there are days in my life, many days in my life, where to me, internally, I'm not Steve Brazel. I'm a radio DJ. I'm actually on the radio. There are days in my life where I am a music photographer. That is my identity, right? My wife is retired. And there are many days I think, you know, I just need to, to give it all up. I need to stop with the podcast and stop with the music photography and stop with the radio. And my wife and I could just go hit balls and play golf all day long yeah. uh, and travel. Uh, we love travel. And as I get older, that that voice is there more prominently, um, which is why, you know, last year I took a six month break on the podcast. I started it back up a couple months ago. And yet I started it up with the idea of I did a show. I never missed a show. And now it's like, you know what? If the show doesn't happen, nobody dies. Most people won't notice. And I'm okay with that. It's a lot less stress, right? Yeah. But where am I going with it? That's really hard to say because if I give it up, if I truly retired to the point where I didn't do any of it, I think I might have an identity crisis because mm -hmm. being able when the, the going back to the start of the conversation when you said when you're in a, a you know an elevator and somebody says to you you're at a cocktail party, somebody says what do you do? Or I know you're a photographer, what do you shoot? That answer you know, I, I'm on KCAL FM or I, I'm a concert photographer or I, I, you know, I have a podcast or whatever it is, or I'm an IT person. Those are all how I identify myself partially internally as well as externally. So if they go, there's that fear of what am I? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I think most creatives have that problem. Maybe it's just Steve's really screwed up. I don't know. But I, I think where I'm going with it is I want to create, from a photography point of view, <clears throat> I want to create a body of work that I'm just really proud of, that at any given point in time, I can say, yeah, this is what I used to do. I want to be on the radio because when I talk to people through the airwaves, it is really fun to me to, to imagine, you know, this guy's in his car. This person's in their backyard barbecuing um, and trying to identify with those people. And it makes their day better. In terrestrial radio, you know, it's really important. We give people a respite from the news. We play rock music. Now, a lot of people get that on streaming services now, but you'd be shocked how many people don't want to pay for Sirius XM in their car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? So. I, I, we help people. And I think we help people with photography. When you put a photograph of their favorite band in front of them, that means something to people. And I, yeah. I, I like that I have a small part in that. I, I, I throw my little two cents in there. Um, I think from my external unqualified, you know, to be making, making statements about Steve Brazel's <laughs> existence. Um, but I, I think, you've already contributed a ton to several different worlds, you know, on the radio side, on the, you know, even my world, understanding whiskey, uh, on the, obviously on the photography side. No, you don't impacted... understand whiskey until you try that bottle. <laughs> correct. Correct. Uh, uh, well, my journey of understanding whiskey, yeah. let's say. <laughs> you've laid a brick on my little road. Um, but, you know, even on the photography side, the concert photography side for you, you've impacted countless bands and the people who love and admire those bands, right? They've, they've lived through it. So does there need to be an end game? Right. I don't know that there needs to be an end game in this. If you're doing what you love doing, why not just keep doing what you love doing till you can't do it anymore? Right. And then, and right. then switch, switch gears. Right. I think that's and the, the, key, the key is to do it on your terms. Right. To be yeah. able to say, you know what? I haven't shot a show for a couple of months. I'm ready to shoot another show. There's a show I want to shoot. Let's shoot that one. Yeah. Uh, you know, or. I'm not going to stress over if a podcast episode doesn't happen on the schedule that it needs to happen. If you're trying to build a YouTube channel, if you are trying to build a successful podcast, then yes, 
your audience expects your episode at 10 o'clock every Thursday morning or every other Thursday morning or whatever your schedule is, and you have an obligation to serve them that. And then there becomes a point where, yeah, but my mental health matters. Um, mm -hmm. I don't care if I lose listeners. Uh, I just truly love doing it. I mean, it's like you. you. You and I have had this conversation many, many times. I don't think you and I would ever be happy if periodically we weren't sitting doing this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I would do this if I wasn't getting paid to do it. Right. And I have right. <laughs> for many, many years. Yeah. And I don't get paid to do it, but it's right. fun. I started my podcast because I wanted to ask people questions. Right. I was new to photography, semi new to photography. And it's like, I just, I, you know, I see that Joe McNally shot and God, I wish I could say to Joe McNally, how are you lighting up in that second floor window? Right. I just want to ask questions. So a podcast is a great way to get people in front of me to ask questions. And we learn from it, right? We yeah, a hundred percent learn from it if it's if it's done right. Now I will say, I don't always do it right, right? I've got a lot of interview experience through radio, through television, through whatever, and I still screw it up all the time. But when you learn a few tips and tricks, um, and you get somebody on the other side of that that video that you're watching that does it well enough, uh, it makes a big difference. Yeah. 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 What a good conversation. Um, I want to end with, um, just the, like we talked about kind of where all this is going. What's, what's in, what's on your immediate horizon? Like what, where not so much like the next show I'm going to shoot or I'm, you know, I'm going right. to, I'm going to be at Beyonce's after party thing, whatever, you know, what's the next thing, the next big thing for Steve that, that you're excited about? Like if I went through your YouTube history, I would see, oh, Steve's interested in woodworking now. Like what, what am I going to learn? Part of me bounces around with, I'd love to start a whiskey channel. There's so much whiskey tube out there that's really good. I don't know that I would bring anything good or new to it, so I don't. But that would be fun to be able to do a whiskey channel because I truly do love whiskey. I do yeah. a pick on the radio. I do a every week. I do a, a I call it KCAL on the rocks because we say it's KCAL rocks, but it's KCAL on the rocks. Anyway, um, but for me, with what I'm doing now. I'm kind of in that mode where I only want to shoot the shows I really want to shoot. So I mostly shoot when I do concerts, I shoot for KCAL, which is the journalistic side of things. And then I do a review of the show and a blog post on the KCAL website for it. But a lot of what I do is I shoot for, I'm what's called a house photographer. I shoot for the venue. So Live Nation's got venues. I shoot for Live Nation and give them the pictures for marketing, or I shoot for Toyota Arena or whatever the case might be. <clears throat> but the problem with being a house photographer, the, the advantage to being a house photographer is I get to shoot shows I'd never get to shoot. So when I was a house photographer for San Manuel Indian Bingo and Casino, which is now called Yamava, uh, back with their old showroom, again, most of what I shoot for KCAL is going to be rock or rock related because KCAL has no reason to have me post a review of Taylor Swift, right? Yeah. Or of a country artist or of a hip hop artist. But when I'm photographing for the house, I get to photograph banda and mariachi and hip hop and rap and blues and jazz and whatever it is and country. And I love that variety. On the other hand, I'm at the point now where it's, I really want to shoot artists that I want to shoot. I don't want to just be called in to photograph, you know, this particular artist that's performing that I have no connection to really no desire to see. I love every show I go to, but again, there's a, a thing with country artists or with Latin artists where we tend to not be in a photo pit right in front of the stage. We tend to be way back at the mixing board shooting with a, a 400 to 600 lens. And those just don't interest me as much anymore. So immediately I just kind of want to shoot what I want to shoot. I'd love to have been able to do a tour. I think I'm too old for it, um, but I would have loved to have been able to do a tour at some point. And then radio wise, radio may at some point transition to just doing podcasting. Mm -hmm. This to me is so much, 
I love the video aspect, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I I yell at everybody I know. Our our mutual friend Don Komarechka. I don't know if you know Dave Clayton. Do you know Dave? Uh, I don't. The name doesn't ring a bell. He shoots. He draws podcast. He does it with Alan Hass, uh, concert photographer, also. And uh, I've looked at both of them and said, why not do video? Okay, mm -hmm. just release it as an audio podcast. But if you just you're on Zoom, you're looking at each other while you're recording the audio. If all you did was record the video and put it on YouTube, yeah. there is such facial expressions add so much yeah. to what you're doing. Yeah. And most people will still listen to the audio. My podcast, probably 56% listen to audio and the rest are, are what listen to, you know, watch the video. But yeah. still, a facial expression can change every interpretation. Why not? It doesn't cost anything today. This what you and I do has been so democratized that anybody watching this can start a podcast tomorrow. Yeah, and that's that's going to be another show that you and I are going to do um, because yeah, I think it's even I was going to say worse than that, but I think it's it's moved even beyond the democratization of podcasting into the automation of podcasting. I was a uh, looking at this um, this video the other day, and it was talking about how someone had built this AI that you could just give it a couple of topics and it would create a podcast, a two host podcast, where they were dialoguing back and forth about that topic that sounded like regular, there wasn't robots, it sounded like regular humans having a banter, a male and a female talking back and forth. And I was like, that's actually pretty good. <laughs> But it's yeah, not going to it's not going to be us. But if you're just no. looking for the information, that's not bad, right? But as soon as as soon as one of those bots goes, I'm sorry, Dave. I can't <laughs> unlock the door, Dave. Exactly. We're in trouble, right? Exactly. But more than that, but more than that is all you have to do is look at right now the podcast industry, and we've all heard it, where you have that podcast you listen to, and in the or YouTube's a good example too. Mid sentence. Auto ad insertion. Oh my God. Yeah. Like the AI can't figure out where a good pregnant pause is to break and insert an ad. Yeah. Like it'll stick it in the middle of a word. Still to this day, you can do chat GPT for all you want. They can't do automatic ad insertion properly, in my opinion. As yeah, soon as you break that sentence and insert an ad, I've lost, I, you broke the entire flow for It me. feels rude. Yeah, it feels rude. You're like, I'm engaged and all of a sudden, oh, by the way, Squarespace is, <laughs> you know. Right, or, yeah. or it's you're mid talking back to the show. Yeah. Like they're saying something and you're going, no, you forgot, wait, why is it a commercial now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's- A lot of that's the creator's fault though, because the creator can, can, leave spots for advertising so, and like like right. you would do on your radio show where you say hey yep. you know you know what's funny about that uh i'll let you know after this commercial break and just leave a logical pregnant pause for and then target that spot when you publish the episode for the advertising to be inserted so youtube gives you the tools not to be yep. you know an idiot but yeah you can mark the <laughs> spots but nobody takes the time no. most of the people have horrible audio a lot of them have horrible video. It shocks yep. me when I see somebody released a video the day before and it's got 111,000 views in 17 hours. And you're like, okay, well, that's the topic I want to watch right now. Let me watch it. And it's horrible. Yeah. And I can't figure it out. But, you yeah, know, for it, podcasting, you can, you can insert tertiary tones like we do in radio that automatically yeah. trigger something. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, it took, I'm still learning this, this rule and I still haven't figured it out, but quality does not necessarily equal views <laughs> in, the, in this new world. You could put out a, a crappy video of somebody blowing their nose and it'll have a million views, but Steve puts 30 hours into editing all the ums and ahs out of a podcast and polishes it to perfection not 30 million views <laughs> right now and it's it, there's times it's frustrating there's uh, you know i just always try and disclaim it to myself of well you know youtube is designed for 10 to 15 minute videos and mine are an hour so that's it well that's not it that's it's not it. 
it's you know i just i'm not a lot of people's taste <laughs> but that's okay because yeah. the beauty of what we do is i don't tailor my show and i don't think you do either we have an audience i don't tailor my show to an audience no i make the show that i want to make bingo and the assumption is if i like it and i listen to every show back start to finish as i edit i watch the entire video back if i like it then there's probably somebody else out there and this is how monty python i, I saw an interview once with I, I think it was eric idol or somebody that basically said the way we knew if a joke was going to make the show and that it was funny is when we went through it, we all laughed. If yeah. we liked it, somebody else had to like it. And I, I kind of live off of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I Very similar thinking. My thinking is I am part of my audience, right? So as yeah. long as I'm genuine to myself and the things that I'm interested in, like, you know, Nikon and VR and AR and AI and you know, how it works with photography, you know, all the things, right? As long as I'm talking about those, one, my enthusiasm for that topic will transmit yes. through the microphone versus yes. me talking about brain surgery and reading from a list of questions on my notepad and trying to make it sound like I know what I'm talking about. But if I'm genuinely interesting, interested in the topic, even selfishly so, like, hey, I'm interviewing someone about this camera that I feel like I wanna buy, so I'm just gonna ask, you know, pre-purchase questions <laughs> for the whole interview. And there's going to be a bunch of people out there in the same boat as me that are going to find this really interesting because they have the same questions. So, yeah. So I, I, the, the things that the I do are like people, you get that? the comments from people then you say, you know, on YouTube or whatever saying, Oh, you know, this person is just doing this for themselves. And it's like, well, yeah, that's yeah. the point, <laughs> right? I'm creating content that I think is beneficial. And if yeah. I think it's beneficial, hopefully you do. And if it's not, you can watch something that does. But I, I think you worded it perfectly. You are your target, right? Literally, you are your target audience. Yeah, yeah. If you find it interesting, then the way you deliver it will be genuine and relatable to the other people that are kind of in your same boat even some that aren't. Um, let's end this, Steve Brazel. I'm gonna put you on the spot again, uh, since you have radio chops and that, that golden whiskey voice of yours, you gotta sign us off using the, go into Steve mode and sign us off as if you were signing off a radio program, you know, and handing off the mic to the next DJ. So take your time. What's your tagline that you sign off with? Um, I don't have one. I used to sign off with take that lens cap off. It's time That's to take what, that, that lens it. cap off. Yeah. But, but so you use, use that, that anymore. Yeah, I, okay. I'm bringing it back. So you can be the first. So whenever you're ready, sir, you have the con. <laughs> Thanks again to Frederick for having me on. I appreciate it. Keep in mind that what you're watching is this week in photo. This is the gold standard for photography podcast. So you're in the right place. Make sure that you check it out each and every week with Frederick Van Johnson, Frederick Van Johnson, Frederick Van Johnson. I got it out that time, right? I'm Steve Brazel. Now go take that lens cap off. This is Twitter.